Hello folks, it's me Vance, owner and operator of the Ventriloquist Vance channel here on YouTube, as well as the Vance Dykes channel, obviously because my name is Vance Dykes. In this video, I'm going to talk about why I'm pursuing the priesthood in the Episcopal Church, or Anglican Church, whatever you want to call it. It's basically the same church. They both come from the Church of England. Basically, I'm going to take the time in this video to discuss why I've always felt the desire in my heart to want to be a priest for a long time. And there's no better way to do that than going back to the beginning. It all started in my um, late teen years and early adulthood years. Um, I remember in my late teen years, I was seriously considering what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I pretty much thought of a lot of things. I thought about being a police officer, a military officer, either in the United States Air Force or in the U.S. Army. I even thought about, you know, going into politics, you know. But also, I've had ambitions to be a preacher, you know. I grew up in a uh, Pentecostal household. I was born into a Pentecostal family, and uh, occasionally we went to church. And whenever we went to church, I saw the preachers, and there was just something about the preachers that just spoke to me. Like, that's what I wanted to do. And um, I also watched some televangelists on TV, and likewise, seeing the uh, preachers in the Pentecostal churches, and when I moved to Florida, I spent some time in a non-denominational church in Sanford in Florida, in Seminole County, and <clears throat> all the time that I have been in church and saw the preachers preach and saw televangelists on TV, I just, I just liked what they did. There was just something about what they were doing that just really interested me, and I just, I thought to myself, that's something I want to think about pursuing. Even though my heart at the time was set on being a law enforcement officer. Um, so, and, um, to go with my desire to want to be a preacher, I have also thought about being a priest, a Catholic priest just as well. Um, where that came from was, I used to watch a lot of TV and movies as a kid and even through my adolescent years and in my early adulthood years. And um, I remember watching shows like The Golden Girls and Soap, two shows that were created by Susan Harris. And um, in the show, we were exposed to characters that were Catholic priests. And I don't know, whenever I saw the Catholic priest, there was just something about them that just made me think that I wanted to be just like them just as well. You know, there were, there were times when I thought, that's the kind of preacher that I want to be, a priest. And, but of course, I knew about, well, I didn't really know much about the Catholic Church at the time. Um, I knew that the clergymen in the church were supposed to be celibate, meaning that they could not get married. <clears throat> and, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know much about the Catholic Church. I knew that they had priests, I knew they had nuns, and they have monks and friars and a pope. I didn't know anything about uh, bishops and deacons just yet. And, um, but what really made me decide that I really wanted to be a priest above all else was when I first went to a Catholic church. And how this got started was that, you know, there was a time when I was living in Winter Springs, which was pretty much, I wouldn't say it was right next door to Sanford, where my non-denominational church at the time was at. But it was close by. You know, I lived in Seminole County in Florida at the time. <clears throat> and for a time, I just didn't go to church for a while. And I remember being on the phone with my grandmother, and she expressed to me how important it is for my um, spiritual welfare as a Christian to go to church. And I believed and knew in my heart that she was right. So I went back to the non-denominational church. But there were some weekends where my parents and I went to the villages to visit some friends and, um, you know, and I expressed how I felt it was important for me to go to church on Sundays and I think my dad had the idea that maybe one of our friends, Pat, you know, 
our friends were uh, Pat and Greg. You know, they were uh, somewhat of an elderly married couple that had been friends with my father for many years. I wouldn't say they were elderly because, you know, Pat didn't look like Sophia Petrillo from the Golden Girls and Greg didn't look, didn't look like, I'm trying to think of the most elderly person I can think of. Well, let's just say he didn't have the uh, white hairs of recent popes, let's put it that way. <clears throat> um, let's see, I just lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, so my father asked Pat if I could go to church with her because she was Catholic. He said it would be a good opportunity, to, uh, I'm sorry, a good opportunity to see what it was like for, I mean, it would be a good opportunity for me to see what a Catholic service is like. I consented to that. And that particular Sunday, we went to the uh, St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church, which was just a mile outside of the villages. I think it was in Wildwood. If, if, I'm, if I'm correct about this, I think it's actually north of the villages. I don't really remember. I never took the time to lay out the foundations of the villages in my mind of that's north, that's west, that's east, and this is south, and so on. <clears throat> So, um, I went to the St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church, and one of the first things that I noticed was that, mm, this is not what I remember seeing from the Sister Act movies. <laughs> oh, gosh. I noticed that there were some differences between what the Sister Act movies portrayed and what I was seeing. But one of the first things that I noticed was that Catholic services are very peaceful. I mean, yes, you're standing, but you're not bouncing around, you're not jumping around and singing like you're at some sort of a rock and roll concert or a country concert. And um, I just, I liked it. I liked that kind of service, a traditional service. And I just remember seeing the um, clergymen at the altar, the deacons and the priest, and there was just something about seeing those clergymen that just captivated me and seeing what they did. And there was just something about it all that just made me think that was what I wanted to do. So I was thinking that maybe I would want to be a deacon because I know that in the Catholic Church there are some deacons that are married. Those are the uh, vocational deacons or the permanent deacons. Those are the deacons who get married before ordination, but they never become priests or bishops in the church. So I was thinking about that. I was seriously considering that. And then a few, a few weeks later, we went back. And this time, Pat took me to another Catholic church, which was on the other side of the villages from where she and her husband lived. And this Catholic church was the St. Timothy Catholic Church, or the St. Timothy Catholic Cathedral. It's in the villages. Or it's, at least it's in the area where the villages where the villages are. And I remember I remember being in the pews in the congregation and I remember seeing the priest at that church. And I was thinking when I was sitting in the pews and looking at the priest giving his sermon to the congregation I thought about the televangelist that inspired me to want to be a preacher myself. And I looked at him, and in a sense, he just made me think, you know, there was just something about how he was preaching that just made him seem like a, a Catholic televangelist. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that as I saw the priest in the uh, St. Timothy Catholic Church give his sermon to the congregation, it was at that moment that I thought to myself, this is what I really want to do. I really want to be a priest. But of course, you know, remembering that priests are celibate, and um, I've never thought of myself as the kind of person who was supposed to be celibate, you know? My whole life, even growing up, I have seen women, and I have seen that women are very beautiful creatures, and I just always thought I would always get married to a beautiful woman, and, you know, that was something that I'm just, 
I was never, and even right now, that is something that I never am going to give up. I am never going to give up my right to be a married man. But I still wanted to be a priest. So eventually, excuse me, what I decided to do was I decided to do some research. I decided to do some research on the Catholic Church and on other churches that I later discovered were Catholic in tradition, excuse me, but were not Roman Catholic. I started to do some research on some other church denominations. So I researched the Roman Catholic Church, I researched the Eastern Orthodox Church, which I think of all Christian denominations, they have multiple branches. They have, there's, let me see, there's the Church of, I hope I pronounced this right, Antioch or Antioch. There's the Church of Alexandria. There's the Church of Greece. There's the Church of Armenia. There's the Church of Russia. And there's the Church of the Ukraine. I think there's more, but I can't think of them right now. But I think I may have named them all. But yeah, I've researched the Eastern Orthodox Church. I've researched the Anglican Church slash Episcopal Church, which is the church that I'm a member of right now. We'll get to how I got into the Anglican Church later. I researched the Lutheran Church, and in my research, I even discovered a Christian denomination that I never even thought existed, never knew existed until I did my research. The Old Catholic Church, which is like the Roman Catholic Church, only very different. So I did my research, and another thing that I did was I prayed. I prayed to God that he would help me to find the right church that was Catholic, a church where I could be a priest but at the same time, not sacrifice my right to be a married man, not sacrifice any of my Protestant beliefs that I've always held in my heart to be true, and not feel like by selling out my Protestant beliefs that I would be selling out Jesus. Like being a Judas, theologically and philosophically speaking. And as I continued to do more research, I um, read something on the internet about what the Anglicans believed about purgatory and how their beliefs about purgatory are different from the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church in regards to purgatory. They don't really believe in purgatory. They do believe in an intermediate state, however. And just when I read that their beliefs about purgatory are different from that of the Roman Catholics, I just thought to myself, hmm. Maybe this is a church I really need to look into. And as I did, I discovered the St. Francis Anglican Church, which was on Fortune Road, which was along the border between Kissimmee and St. Cloud in Osceola County. And I called up the uh, priest who was the pastor at the church at the time. His name was Reverend James Reber. And when I called him, I spent like maybe a good 20 to 30 minutes on the phone with him. And then after that, I um, went to the church, and ever since then, I became very involved with the Anglican Church. I expressed to Father Jim about my desire to want to be a priest, and he said that he would help me out. And I remember him and a few other um, clergymen or lay ministers that were serving at the church at the time, you know, they talked to me about what it, what it was going to take for me to become a priest in the Anglican Church. And one of the things that they said was that um, I had to go to school for seven years. Basically, you know, five years, no, sorry, four years. Four years in the traditional college, you know, your freshman year of college, your sophomore year of college, and so on and so forth, you know, earning your bachelor's degree. And it could be in anything, you know. It could be like maybe business. It could be like counseling. It could be church ministries, you know. I'm just, recollect, I'm just, I have a hard time pronouncing this word, recollecting everything that I went through in the past. So er, my memories are kind of vague when it comes to small details, so please bear with me. Um, so yeah, so four years in an accredited college or university, and then three years in seminary. So as of right now, I am in my, I guess you could say, my third year of college taking online courses with Liberty University, trying to get a bachelor's degree in Christian ministries. I haven't really 
thought of what seminary I'm going to go to just yet. I have some ideas, but no official plans as of right now. So anyway, um, in regards to that, you know, five Sundays into worshiping at the uh, St. Francis Anglican Church, they already vested me up in, you know, the cleric's robes, and I started serving as an acolyte. And basically what an acolyte is in the church is they are basically lay ministers, and they have the responsibility of traditionally bearing the light of Christ into the world. And how they do that in church services is they simply light candles at the altar, and they bear the uh, torches or candle torches, whatever you want to call them, to the altar during procession to and from the altar at the beginning and at the end of services. Um, so, yeah. Five Sundays into worshiping at the St. Francis Anglican Church in Kissimmee, I was already vested up, and I started serving as a lay minister. And um, around the Christmas season, I started to study the catechism so I could officially be confirmed into the faith. And um, it was, I think, if I remember correctly, it was January 27th of 2013 when I was confirmed into the Anglican Church. And I've actually got a video of that here on the Ventriloquist Vans channel. It's just going to be buried underneath a lot of Ventriloquist videos. But it is one of my most popular videos on the channel, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. It's one of my videos that has the most views. And the bishop who confirmed me into the church, I don't remember his full name, but his name was Bishop Chad. And um, he was known as the... Uh, smiling bishop or the happy bishop because he always had that happy personality. He was almost like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, only American. And um, he's actually in that video where I'm being confirmed, obviously, because he confirmed me. And I have another video where he's featured where I have my John the Baptist puppet and we're in the car and John the Baptist is getting homesick and um, Bishop Chad is driving the car. So, Bishop Chad is featured in two of my videos, the, uh, My Being Confirmed in the Anglican Church and John the Baptist in the Car. Those videos shouldn't be too hard to find. Um, so yeah. And I just lost my train of thought again. Why am I so good at that? Oh yeah, so, um... Even before I was confirmed into the church, and even after I was confirmed, I was there for the church through thick and through thin. I was always there for the priest and for the lay ministers and the bishops. I was always there. I was with them through thick and through thin, through good and through bad. And we've had our time, we've had our good times, and we've had our bad times, and I was always there with them. I was loyal and I was faithful to them, as well as to the church and to the congregation. If I remember correctly, I think it was like June or July, July, I think it was July of 2012 when I first went to the St. Francis Anglican Church. I think so. Because I know that before then I was, sir, not, not sir, I was worshiping in a Nazarene church that's not too far from my house. It's the, the uh, what is it, Kissimmee First Church of the Nazarene, which is on Millslow Road. And I've been there for a while, and um, for a time I was with the uh, youth group, you know, I was trying to be like an associate, I wouldn't say like pastor, but basically an assistant to the uh, youth pastor there, and I expressed to him my desire to want to help him out. And he said that he would, you know, help me out with that. You know, he said he would speak to the pastor of the church about it, but he never did. And um, whenever he would be busy doing something, he would leave enough, he would leave someone else in charge of the group instead of leave me in charge with the group, which pretty much told me that I don't think he took me seriously. And it was when, you know, I was 19, about ready to become 20, and he took me aside and he told me that it's not a good idea for me to come to the, uh, 
youth group anymore because I'm going to be 20 years old. So basically an adult. So, and you know, that bummed me out, you know, because I told him that, I told him why I was there. I was there because I wanted to help him out with the youth group. And he said he would talk to the uh, pastor about allowing me to become an assistant for him, but never did. And leaving someone else in charge of the youth group, instead of leaving me in charge with the youth group, knowing full well why I've been a part of the youth group wanting to help, wanting to be the assistant to the youth pastor, and telling me that I needed to stop coming to the youth group because I was now literally an adult, or about ready to become an adult, no longer a teenager. Because once you go from 19 to 20, you're not a teenager anymore. Even though officially you're seen as an adult at the age of 18, you still have two more years of teenage years. You still have two more teenage years ahead of you. So, so there you go, you know, something I tried to do in the Nazarene church, didn't get far, then went to the Anglican church, expressed an interest in wanting to be a priest, instantaneously, five Sundays, bested up, starting to serve at the altar. I think the Anglican church took me a lot seriously, a lot more seriously than the Nazarene church did. So there you go. And also I think because the Nazarene Church is a much larger group compared to the St. Francis Anglic Anglican Church at the time. Um, let's see. So yeah, 2012 up until 2015, I've been serving at the church as a lay minister. And um, as I... As we went further into the future, I eventually became a lay reader and a chalice bearer. So I was pretty much moving up in ranks in regards to lay ministry. And Bishop Jim, oh yeah, I forgot to mention about that. Eventually, Father Jim became Bishop Jim. So that's why in some earlier videos where I talk about my journey to the Anglican priesthood, and in some later videos of my time at St. Francis Anglican Church, you notice that I've called him Bishop Jim instead of Father Jim, and it's because he became a bishop. <clears throat> and um, in 2015, he and I were talking, this was after I became a chalice bearer, by the way, after I became both a reader and a chalice bearer. He was talking to me about me becoming a deacon in the church, not a preaching deacon because I hadn't gone to seminary just yet. I think at this time it was like maybe four years after I graduated from Valencia College with an associate's degree, only two years. <clears throat> and um, so, but I was so involved with church ministry and, you know, as time went by, we became a smaller, smaller group for many reasons. Um, reasons I might talk about in another video because my main focus is trying to tell the story of why I'm becoming a priest in the church. And um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've got sinuses. They're really irritating me right now. So I'm going to be spending some time clearing my throat every once in a while. So please bear with me. Um, so he was talking to me about possibly ordaining me as a deacon, not a preaching deacon because I didn't go to seminary just yet. Um, but yeah, but of course <clears throat> it never happened because unfortunately Bishop Jim lost his uh, battle to cancer. He died in November of 2015. And after he died, I pretty much went on hiatus for a while because you know I didn't have transportation to take myself to and from church. And pretty much when Bishop Jim died, the St. Francis Congregation, which eventually became known as the Redeemer Congregation. You know, we changed our name from the St. Francis Anglican Church to Redeemer Anglican Church. Pretty much everyone just went their separate ways after that. I'm not sure exactly what happened to everybody else. <clears throat> but all I know um, about myself is that I went on hiatus for a while because... Um, 
I didn't have a car. I couldn't drive myself to another Anglican or Episcopal church. And, you know, I wanted to focus more on earning money so I could start establishing my life here so that, you know, when the time was right, I could get my fiance in the Philippines and her kids, bring them here to America so that we could start a family. So I pretty much spent more time focusing on uh, my job and focusing on my videos on YouTube, hope, hoping that um, my ventriloquism would become more popular. And as of right now, as I'm making this video, my videos are becoming more popular on YouTube and I'm now at 850 subscribers. So all I just need is just, I'm gonna say about 200 more subscribers so I can get, well, my goal is to get 1,000 subscribers, but add 900, 200 to 850, I would get um, 1,050 subscribers. I'm just pretty much thinking I just need two more, I mean 200 more subscribers and that's, I'm good to go. <clears throat> so basically, I'm getting more popular on YouTube. But as of right now, you know, I'm not considering being a stand-up ventriloquist as a career. I'm happy being a YouTube entertainer. I'll get, I'll probably discuss that later on in another video. Um, so I went on hiatus for a while. And then came Christmas 2016 when I was working and it was, of course, it's the Christmas season. And of course, there's decorations all over the place, and there's Christmas music being played. Um, the thing about me is that when I was a kid, when I think about Christmas, I would think about the Christmas presents. What am I going to get? Am I going to get a new Batman action figure? Am I going to get some dinosaur toys? You know, I, it was either about presents or it was about you know the Christmas decorations that just created like a magical Christmas fairy tale world for me, and the Christmas fairy tales that we've all come to know and love. You know. The stories of Santa Claus, Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and so on and so forth. But nowadays when I think about Christmas, I think about the Christian church. I think about how Christmas is a Christian holiday and how significant it is to the Christian faith. I think about the Christian church. I think about great Christian men and women that came before us that set the foundation for the Christian church now and thinking about basically what it was was that, you know, Christmas kind of reminded me how important it was for me to be in church and how important it was for me to be a priest. So after about maybe a year of going on hiatus, I pretty much decided to my, I pretty much thought to myself, you know, even though I don't have a car right now and I can't drive myself anywhere, I can't drive myself to a church, what I can do at least is go back to school and start getting a Christian education and academically work my way to <clears throat> the Anglican priesthood. So basically what I did was around the Christmas season and after the Christmas season, I started doing some research on some Christian colleges where I could take some online courses and one of the schools that I looked into was Liberty University. And um, I can't remember all the other schools I looked into. I'm pretty sure I may have looked into um, Valencia, wanting to go back to Valencia, because I was a student at Valencia College for two years. That's where I got my associate's degree from. If you take a look to uh, my right over here, you see in any videos where I've been right here, either giving whether doing vlogs or doing ventriloquist videos, and I sat here, you saw this like black robe over here. This is my uh, graduation gown, my cap and gown from when I graduated from Valencia. It's right there. So, and like I said, I don't remember all the uh, colleges that I looked into, but Liberty was one of them. And of all the schools that I was looking into, Liberty University was the one that reached out to me, you know, say, hey, you want to complete your uh, education, you want to achieve your academic goals, we can help you to do that, you know, they've done that, and they were persistent, and eventually I said to myself, you know what, this is the school I'm going to go to, so I filled out the application, I filled out the FAFSA, and wham, bam, there I am, <laughs> excuse me, 
it was in February of this year, 2017, when I started taking courses for Liberty University, trying to get a bachelor's degree in Christian ministries. And as of now, I've already finished up four courses. I was going to do a vlog video giving an update on uh, my academic success, but I, I, think, I think I can do it here. Um, so, I finished up my fourth course, which was one of my uh, theology courses, and I passed it with a B. So I'm very happy about that. I'm in my uh, fifth course right now for the fall term, and I'm doing well in that course. I've already taken um, two quizzes, and I've passed them with A's. So I'm doing very well. So, let's see. It's now um, September, and I started in February, so I would say like maybe, um, I would say about maybe seven to eight months I've been taking online courses. And then later on, in the late summer, I thought to myself, you know, even though I may not have a car right now, I should at least put in some effort to still try and go to a church so I can get involved, because I know that Academic requirements are only half of the pie. It's half the piece of the pie in becoming a priest. The other half is being involved in church. So eventually what I did was, and even though my car was getting ready, because at this time I bought a car, but I had a mechanic take a look at it and fix it up for me. Um, and it would be a few more Sundays before it would be all good and ready. And as of now, it's a Labor Day 2017, my car is up and running, and I've been driving myself to church for three Sundays now. But before then, I started walking to church again. And I walked to the um, St. John's Episcopal Church, which is on John Young Parkway, which is right across the street from the Kissimmee First Baptist Church. And on that same road is the um, Warman Church. So I expressed to one of the priests there that I wanted to become a priest, and what she said was, this is, a progress this is a progressive church, by the way, so there was a female priest that was there at the time, and she said that one of the things that I needed to do was be a parishioner in the pews in the congregation for about six months, and talk to the main priest of the church, Father Cecil, and uh, he's going to be coming back very soon, and when he comes back, I'm going to be talking to him about my becoming a priest in the church. And um, I'll tell him my journey and where I am academically right now. So yeah, so for the past, let me see. Yesterday, I went to church. Sunday before that. I think it's been six weeks since I went back to church. It's been six weeks since I've gone to, when I started going to the uh, St. John's Episcopal Church. So, so that's pretty much where I am right now. That's pretty much the story as to why I'm becoming a priest in the Episcopal Church. It's something, it's one of the things that I've always wanted to do ever since I was a teenager, ever since I was younger. It's something that I've always wanted to do. Aside from being a police officer, aside from being a military officer, and aside from going into politics, becoming like maybe mayor of a city, sheriff of a county, and being governor of a state, and maybe even being senator in Congress, you know, aside from everything else that I've always wanted to do, I have always wanted to be a priest. And looking back on my life, I think, you know, I've done a lot of research. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, I've worked hard trying to do things in life. I've worked hard trying to be a law enforcement officer, I've worked hard trying to get into the military, and I've worked hard trying to become a priest. And of everything that I've worked the most hardest on, that I put the most effort in, it was being a priest. I've put the most effort, the most research in becoming a priest, more than anything else. So, for those reasons, I really do feel that I really want to be a priest. I feel like God has always wanted me to be a priest for a long time, and I'm now doing that. I'm now fulfilling the academic requirements. I'm getting involved in church again, and I've told you the story as to how I got to where I am right now. So, 
if you have any questions and if you want me to talk more about my history of me being involved in the Anglican Church, my walk with Christ, what I've always wanted to do, why I have not chosen certain career paths that I was talking about. You know, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So, thanks very much for taking the time to listen to me and I hope you have a happy Labor Day.